Okay, so let us get on with the proof process. Uh, in the last segment, we looked at the semantics of proportional logic, emphasizing the fact that you can use proportional symbols to stand for anything. And we saw that P, Q, R, S, T, all these stand for some statements which are there. Once we have done this encoding, uh, what we are left with is a knowledge base, which is what you can see this set of statements P and Q, P implies R, R and S implies T and so on. And we are saying that given this knowledge base, can we find a proof uh, for the statement T, that given this knowledge base, is there a way of adding T to the knowledge base? That is the syntactic process of finding a proof. And we will accept that to, to mean that the sentence is true, because we have accepted our logic to be sound. So, let us look at the notion of proofs in proportional logic. Some statements are given to us and so we accept them without questioning, because they are given to us, they are the premises. These are the four statements that we have interested in here, uh, Alice likes mathematics and she likes stories and so on and so forth. And these are the four statements and we are interested in showing that T is true. Now, the process of making inference is, is to choose one of the rules of inference that we very briefly discussed and you can go back and revise them, you probably already know them, to keep adding new statements. So, we can add P and Q and R and S in this order, then R and S and then T. So, it is not a very long proof as you can see. Let us look at this in a little bit detail. Why can we add P and Q? We are given that P and Q is true, so therefore P is true. Hmm? There was a rule called simplification. Uh, this again emphasizes the fact that it is a symbolic process. It is uh, we are not looking at meaning. You can't say that you, if you have said that uh, P and Q is true, P is obviously true. Yes, of course it's obviously true, but to be able to say that in a proof you must have a rule which allows you to say that. And the rule is simplification uh, and it says that if there is a conjunct, you can take any one of them and add it to the knowledge base. How do we get R? We get R because we know that P is true and we know that P implies R is true and now we can use modus ponens to generate R. How do we get S? There is another rule which is called disjunctive syllogism, which says that if not Q or S is true and not Q is false, then S must be true, because this is an or and one of them at least has to be true. So, we have got S, then we get R and S, why? Because we have R and we also have S and there is a rule called addition or conjunction. Uh, sorry, not addition, it is called conjunction, uh, which allows you to make a compound sentence given two simple sentences. Once we have R and S, we can use our statement that R and S implies T and we can add T to the statement. This is a process that I am sure you are familiar with. All the school proofs that you wrote in your geometry class or algebra class followed this particular pattern. This is also called natural deduction because this is the kind of thing that humans always do, we are calling it forward chaining here or forward reasoning here essentially. Let us move on to first order version of this uh, story. We stated the relation between mathematics and algebra, saying that if Alice likes maths, then she likes algebra. Now, let us say that this statement is universally true, which means that if anyone likes maths, then they like algebra and the universal statement in English is written like that. If someone likes maths, then she likes algebra. Yeah. And the other statement that if you like algebra and if you like physics, then you will go to college. So, remember I am saying if you like, which means in some sense in English way of saying that if, if anyone likes uh, algebra and if anyone likes physics, they will go to college. Or in other words, for all x, if you like algebra and if you like physics, you will go to college. So, our representation has become richer now as you can see, instead of using statements like P, Q, R in proportional logic, 
we are using predicates. So, one of the predicates we are using is likes. So, this says that likes Alice maths, that is the statement that Alice likes maths. And of course, and has come here as an and, and the second part she likes stories has come as another statement. Statements 2 and 3 are the universally quantified statements, which says that anyone who likes maths likes algebra, and anyone who likes algebra and who likes physics will go to college. And statements 4 and 5 are simply the translation of these two into first, first order logic here. So, 5 statements in English and 5 statements in first order logic, the corresponding statements. It is the same story that we talked about in proportional case, except for the fact that we have made these rules about connections between maths and algebra and between algebra, physics and college universal in the sense that they apply to everyone essentially. And therefore, we can prove this for Alice, but we could have also proved it for Suresh or John or Peter or whatever the case may be. So, let us look at the proof in the first order version. So, this is a knowledge base that we started with, the 5 sentences that we saw in first order logic. And we can generate a proof which is very analogous to the proof in proportional logic. So, the first statement is simply simplification and because we have something and something here, we can take one of them and add it to the listing. We did that in proportional logic. So, there is no difference, only the representation has changed from proportional symbol to a predicate in first order logic. So, stories also in the same way. Uh, this is new that you can say that if Alice likes maths, then she likes algebra. This is something we had said in the proportional story specifically. In the first order story, we said that if anyone likes maths, they will like algebra. So, obviously, using this rule of universal instantiation, if you remember, we can say that okay, it is a universal statement, it applies to everyone, so it must apply to Alice as well. And therefore, we can make this inference that if she likes maths, she likes algebra. Now, we are on our way because we can use modus ponens as before to conclude that she likes algebra. We can also conclude uh, that she likes physics by the same disjunctive syllogism that we did in proportional case. But now, we can produce another statement, which is the conjunction that we did in the first case also. Uh, but another application of the universal instantiation rule, which says that the general rule that if anyone likes algebra and they like physics, they will go to college applies to Alice also. So, we can explicitly say that if she likes algebra and she likes physics, then she will go to college. Having said this, we have already said this in statement 11 uh, here, that she likes algebra and she likes physics. So, we can take 11 and 12 and apply modus ponens and there we are with the proof of the statement that goes to Alice College basically. So, when we moved from proportional logic to first order logic, what we did, of course, we changed the story, we made it more general that anyone who likes maths likes algebra and so on. But we saw that given that, we could still prove that Alice will go to college essentially. It is a little bit like the Socratic argument that we started with, which said that all men are mortal, Socrates is a man and therefore, Socrates is mortal. So, here we are saying that all people who like maths, they like algebra and so on and so forth and Alice likes maths and she likes algebra and therefore, she will go to college. So, this process as I have been saying is forward reasoning or forward chaining. It is a two step process for us for the moment. What is the inference we are doing? We are given two statements P of A, some random predicate that we are talking about and we are given a universal statement which says that for all x, P x implies Q x and our goal is to show that Q of A is true essentially. As we saw in the Alice example, this is a two step process. Uh, in the first step, we apply the rule of universal instantiation, which is here, to generate a specific statement to A, P A implies Q A, and then we use our good old, good old modus ponens to arrive at Q A essentially. 
now we will try to make life simple for us because eventually our goal is to write programs you know not just to do mathematics uh, we will use something called the implicit quantifier notation which will collapse this two step process into one step essentially so the implicit quantifier notation if we have a universally quantified variable we prefix it with a question mark so instead of x we will write it by question mark x and we will drop the universal quantifier because now it is understood between us it is implicit that if there is a question mark before a symbol or a variable it means it is universally quantified we will also handle ex existentially quantified variables but that is a little bit thing that we will not get into right now uh, because uh, we have only one week to do all of logic uh, but there is a process called scolarization which was given to us by Thorolf Skolem where we have Skolem constants and Skolem functions which take care of the existential quantifier for our uh, simple study here we will not even deal with existential quantifiers so the two four statements that we talked about in first order logic are now expressed in uh, implicit quantifier form so what you can see is that whatever was universal has been converted into implicit form essentially whatever was proportional remains as before and whatever was existential there remember that there was a there exists x here there exists x who is a man and x is bright we have replaced it by a special constant which is called a skolem constant as I have mentioned here this SK stands for skolem essentially. So this is the implicit quantifier form in which we can represent our uh, first order logic statements. Essentially we are going to throw away those two symbols for all x and there exists x and somehow have an understanding as to which variable is implicit and which variable is universal and which variable is existential in nature. Existential variables are a little bit more involved but we will not get into that. This is a simple existential statement in which you can replace it with a Skolem constant but there are others which have to be replaced by Skolem functions but we will not look at them in this week. In list notation the same thing happens. Uh, the variable is replaced by either a question mark variable or a Skolem constant in this simple case. Now there is something called a substitution or a unifier, it is a core part of logical reasoning. We will just have a very quick look at this. A substitution and we use Greek symbols like theta is a set of variable and value pairs where each pair tells you what value can you put in place of the variable or what, val what, what values can replace variables in some formulas and that happens if you substitute, if you apply the substitution. Then we have a notion of a unifier and we will very quickly go over this. We say that two formulas alpha and beta, there is a unifier for them. If there is a substitution such that the two formulas become identical, we say that alpha unifies with beta and again the unifier is a substitution. If we apply the substitution to a set of formulas alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n, then they get unified. If when you apply the substitution, so when you write this, this stands for applying it essentially. So we are applying it to alpha 1 here and we apply it to alpha 2, we apply it to alpha n and so on and we find that all the formulas have become the same then we say that they have been unified. So it, there is a whole algorithm for unification again we will not go into that. It can deal with all kinds of complex formulas not just simple ones that we are looking at. But our notion is to explore how deduction is done as search. So we will keep it simple as they say. So now we have a modified modus ponens rule and it uses this implicit 
quantified formulas and it uses the notion of a substitution and it says that if you are given alpha implies gamma and you are given beta, if somehow you can make alpha and beta look same. That is, if there is a unifier theta for alpha and beta, then you take the unifier theta and apply the theta to gamma. What is gamma? Gamma is the consequent. We are still doing modus ponens, we are just doing it when the two formulas alpha and b, the two formulas in the modus ponens do not look identical. One of them may have a variable which is implicitly quantified and so on. So, essentially what we are saying is, if you want to infer from alpha implies gamma, if you want to infer beta, look for a unifier theta here, uh, which unifies alpha and beta. Alpha is the antecedent in the in the implication and beta is the given fact essentially. So, if you can make alpha and beta the same by applying some theta, then ap apply the same theta to the consequent in the implication statement which is gamma and then you have your in implication. So, the figure I hope makes it look simple. So, the first sentence here is a universalist quantifier statement. Remember that there is an implicit quantifier all for all x p x implies q x and what is given to us is p of a essentially. So, again if you look at if p is men and q is mortal and the first statement says all men are mortal and if a stands for Socrates then this is the Socratic argument essentially. But now we are saying that to make this inference, do not go through the process of universal instantiation. Earlier we did that, remember we went from this and we went and said that this must be true and then from this and this we said q of a must be true. So, this two step process we are now collapsing into one step and we are saying that given a universally quantified formula like this, if you can find the substitution which will make them the same then you can go ahead and directly infer q of a because the substitution theta when you apply to this formula q of x gives us this formula q of a and that is our goal in any case. Notice also that this makes life simple for programming. Uh, you do not have to keep guessing as to what instance of universal instantiation you should apply. That comes from the data itself essentially. So, this is a modified uh, modus ponens rules. So, here is an example, uh, if alpha st stands for the statement, uh, it is a compound statement, it uses and here. Uh, it says alpha says that tennis is a sport and Alice likes tennis. This beta and theta, beta and delta say anyone who likes a sport will watch that sport essentially. So, you can see that the sport y can match with tennis being a sport and likes x y can match with likes and Alice tennis. So, we can find a substitution to do that. So, we should be able to infer that Alice will watch tennis. So, that is what it says here. You have to unify alpha with beta here and the theta that you get is x is replaced by Alice, y is replaced by tennis. Then we apply this theta to delta, delta is the consequent there remember and so we substitute this apply this theta to this formula and we get this formula which is what we want to show that Alice will watch tennis. Now, this use the compound formula. So, let us try to take care of that as well. Uh, this is a rule that we are talking about. So, you can map it to tennis and Alice and that kind of stuff, but essentially what it says is that if you are for all x, for all y, this is the first statement here, p x y 
and r of y implies q of x. So, this x and this x are the same and if you are given p of a and some variable z we do not even know what it is, we can still go ahead and infer q of a. So, this is an application of the modified modus ponens rule, but it needs the conjunct as a antecedent in the rule. Very often that is not the case and very often you will get those two formulas uh, separately in your knowledge base. So, we may know something about p, we may know something about r and we may have to pull together those two formulas to form a conjunct. Now, of course, logic allows us to do that. We can use the rule of conjunction uh, which will say given alpha and given beta, you can infer alpha or beta, you can add alpha and beta to the formula. So, given these two things which are given to us separately, uh, we can now combine it to make a com compound formula which is nice because now we can apply modus ponens as you can see here. Uh, uh, this, uh, this conjunct matches this conjunct and then we can make the inference. So, between this formula and this formula, we can infer q of a. But we can sidestep applying this conjunction process as well by simply saying that modify the modus ponens still further to say that if the antecedent has two formulas here and if they are available independently and separately, you can still apply the rule and make the inference that you wanted to make essentially. So, we have been compacting the proof process. First, we said do away with universal instantiation. Now, we are saying do away with conjunction as well essentially. So, of course, you can use conjunction and use this process to get a compound formula and use that directly, but uh, why not simply implement your system so that this will happen implicitly directly essentially. So, now back to our earlier story, you can see that we can find a much shorter proof here. We have used uh, modified modus ponens, so the universal instantiation step has vanished. And here we have used even the further modified modus ponens where we took three arguments and directly concluded that Alice will go to college essentially. Okay, so, this gives us the flavor of forward chaining of forward reasoning in first order logic and we get some idea as to how we can generate proofs for formulas and this process is called theorem proving. We have looked at one aspect forward reasoning, we will go back and look at backward reasoning or backward chaining uh, in the next session. So, see you then.